Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. First, I would like to thank Alison Walton, Julie Carson, and Jean McAvoy from the Immokalee IFS Center for their help and cooperation. Today's program offers one CEU for pesticide license renewal and one CEU for certified crop advisors. If you are attending on Zoom and you need CEUs, email Jean McAvoy your name, your email address, and license number. Today's seminar is sponsored by Sarah Marker and Gerald Hart with Valent. Gerald is with us today for this morning. Thank you, Gerald, for your support. Today's presentation will be given by Dr. Ramdas Fenisari, Assistant Professor with UF IFES, Southwest Florida Research and Education Center in Amakri. The title of his presentation is Improving Yield Safety in Citrus Weed Management. As you know, weeds can reduce the growth, the health, and survival of young trees for the time to come into fruit production. The more competitive the weeds, the more adversely they alter tree physiology, growth, fruit yield, and quality. The attainment of early crop production requires controlling weeds. Weeds alter economic status by competing with trees, particularly young trees, for water, nutrient, and even light in the case of climbing vines, which can easily cover trees if left uncontrolled. Weeds also have various effects on tree performance, including reduced efficacy of microsprinkler irrigation systems and interception of soil applied pesticides. Poor control can sometimes be expected from post-emergence herbicide applications to weeds under stress conditions due to poor uptake and translocation of applied herbicide. Failures in the program can also be due to the actual application, including calibration and or equipment design and operation. Well-maintained, accurately calibrated equipment with good filtration and agitation systems capable of uniform distribution of prescribed spray volumes and droplet size is essential for efficiency and cost-effective vegetation management. Managing weeds in citrus involves several strategies, including chemical weed control. Dr. Penisari will discuss strategies that help growers adopt a weed control program to successfully manage the weeds while minimizing their impact on citrus trees and yield. Dr. Kennison. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, thanks for joining face to face as well as uh, most of our attendees are uh, online on Zoom. So good morning to all of you. Thank you for that introduction, Monji. So I'm Ram Das Kaniseri. I'm a weed scientist here at the Southwest Florida Research and Education Center. So today I'm going to talk about some aspects of enhancing the tree, especially the yield safety in citrus weed management. I had done a, a similar talk in uh, a Citrus Growers Institute a few weeks ago. But today in this talk, I want to uh, focus more or less onto the strategies that we can bring to the table to protect our trees, more essentially to protect our fruits and the yield uh, from any adverse impacts uh, that uh, herbicide may have. So here is how I've uh, outlined this talk. I'll give you a brief overview. Then I'll show some uh, ongoing research that we are doing uh, with some initial results uh, uh, to look at the effects of herbicides uh, on trees. Then I'll also talk about the yield safe uh, herbicide use, some of the strategies we can adopt 
teeny tiny things, but you know, can go a long way. Uh, I mean, the aim is, you know, food drop is a major problem. It's a significant issue now, right now. So we want to make sure uh, the weed management practices are not contributing uh, to this, this big factor, or, uh, not a big factor of this uh, food drop issue. So I'll bring in some strategies and I will summarize it. So let's take a look at the overview. I mean, in a couple of slides, I like to uh, do this overview in all of my talks to bring in the context and to also, you know, uh, give you the message that weed management is very important. You know, sometimes we keep it in the back burner, but it can really help managing the weeds, especially it reduces trees competition for resources. So whatever we are doing uh, to boost the trees should be reaching the trees, right? I mean, it should not be stealing away by the weeds or any other vegetation. So in many of our studies, we found that having a weed checked or weed controlled plot, we get significantly higher yield. For example, in this data, uh, if you have a 75% weed free plot, 75% weed control, you can get at least 25% increase or improvement in the yield. And, and apart from that competition part, having the weeds checked can also help your pest and disease management because we published a study recently where we found some of these uh, uh, weeds, common weeds like Spanish needle, dog fennel or primrose, that we see in our grows or in the perimeter areas or ditches uh, near the grows can actually support the growth of temporarily the growth of uh, silix, ACP, the vector for HLB. So it is very important. As, as a weed scientist, I believe having that weed free grow can also help you in your integrated uh, pest management, especially silid management as well. So there are several advantages of controlling the weeds uh, or having or managing the weeds in your grow. So that's why uh, we understand that growers, when they think about their production budget, they put at least 12 to 15 percentage of cost uh, they set aside for managing the weeds. I mean, this is a rough figure, but this, this is going to change, especially now we have uh, increasing herbicide prices and things like that. But still, we're putting aside a good chunk of money for managing the weeds or weed management program. So we want to make sure you get the best out of that. Uh, it is done effectively, and most importantly, at the same time, it's safe to your trees as well as the yield or food drops. So we have a great weed control toolbox, right? It has, I, I call this toolbox because it has a lot of tools or strategies that we use for managing weeds. But apart from all the tools that we have in the toolbox, in this business, in this weed management business, as a weed scientist, our main, our main friend is herbicides because it's easiest, it's, it's relatively cost-effective, it's easily available, and it gives you a long-term suppression of weeds compared to any other strategies we use. I mean, there are sustainable strategies as well, but when you think about uh, weed management in citrus or tree production holistically, herbicides are the to-go strategy here. But there are downsides. I mean, there are several. I can list a number of advantages we have from using herbicides or chemical weed control, but there is always a concern lurking around there. Why? Because what herbicides are doing, they are controlling the weeds by, uh, you know, uh, killing that plant, by, by, by inhibiting the growth of a particular plant or weed in our case, but they cannot, you know, choose between a plant and, and, and a citrus tree. I mean, everything is planned there. So if you don't use it judiciously or cautiously, there can be a lot of non-target effects or inadvertent effects from herbicide use. And, and, and there is a common consensus or common thought process that trees like citrus or peaches or apple, they are pretty, they're perennial crops. They're pretty uh, what do you call, sturdy and not being so sensitive to herbicides when compared to our uh, annual crops like uh, uh, you know, corn or soybean or vegetables and things like that. But that's not the case. Several tree crops are prone to or very sensitive to herbicides, for example, you can see some pictures here that are injury in citrus, peaches, and apples. So if you don't use or apply or treat the herbicide correctly, it's going to injure your trees. They are sensitive as well. And when you, when you come to citrus, again, the major dilemma we have now is the fruit drop. The fruit drop factor, it's, it's growing, right? We are losing fruits every year, from year to year. And it's a common and significant problem. So my program, one of the focus of my program is to make sure this weed management practice, especially utilizing herbicides or not chemical weed management strategy is not contributing to that stress. It's not 
adding to that stress that ultimately end up in the food crop. So we focus on several things, but uh, mainly we look at the spray contact or drift from an herbicide application. That's gonna happen on a bad day, on a windy day, on a hot day, this is gonna happen, right? Apart from that, whatever herbicides you apply, whether it's a post-emergence or pre-emergence, it's gonna end up in the soil. We would think post-emergence we are applying to the foliage, but research finds that about 55 to 60% of the herbicide you're applying to the foliage ultimately end up in the soil. It could be from decaying wheat foliage, it could be from the application uh, or runoff from the surface of the leaves and things like that. So the herbicides, whether it is pre or post, the ultimate sink is the soil and it can persist there. Not only persist, some of these herbicides can be degraded into degradation product and they can lurk in the root zone of the tree and it could be uptake by the roots, right? That's a possibility there. And, uh, you know, there can be a lot of, uh, symptoms. So the mode of exposure of an herbicide to a tree could be spray contact or drift, or could be from a persistence point of view, uh, residual uptake by the roots and things like that. There can be several mode of exposure a tree can be to a herbicide. And you see symptoms from day to day could be from a mild injury that's going to go by itself. And it can go up to all the way, probably uh, impacting the productivity. I'm not, I'm not saying this is going to happen in citrus, but I'm saying Holistically, when you think about that, it can happen in tree crops. So this is what we are trying to see here. We, have, we want to make sure you guys use, you know, use the herbicide safely, effectively, uh, in, in, in a very, very yield safe way, because we want to keep, make sure it's not hurting your tree. Whatever true fruits are there, it has to be there, right? So let me show you, before going to the strategies, I want to discuss with you some of the initial results we have uh, ongoing uh, that we found from the use of herbicides, uh, the inadvertent effects of herbicide use in citrus. For example, I talked to you about the persistence. So this is a major uh, uh, point. I mean, we don't think about that a lot, actually. But this is very important, just how much, how long, whatever we apply, is going to stay in the soil. And if, if there is a potential for that material to be taken up to the trees and things like that. So this is a profile of a soil in Southwest Florida. We call it flatwood soil. Uh, so whatever applied, so the common uh, thought process here is again, it's sandy soil, right? It's sandy soil. So the chemical we are applying, it's not gonna stay there. It's gonna go, it's gonna leach and we get a lot of rainfall and things like that. It's, it's not gonna persist there. But, and also I want you to uh, bring your attention to this uh, uh, dotted line here. You can see that black coloration or layer which is known as a sporic layer or a, or a hardwood in this part of uh, Florida, we call it hardwood, which, which it's, you know, in this part, we, it has, you know, it's been, it's, we found it around 20 uh, inches or one and a half feet below the ground. And it, it varies all over the location, but I just want to bring your attention to that point here. I'll show you why. So we try to study the persistence of several herbicides utilizing, uh, and I'm showing an example from glyphosate, this is a model because glyphosate is the most popular used herbicide in citrus. And we looked at their movement in a soil depth profile, okay? So see, this is conducted in flatwood soil again. So we found that glyphosate moved from the top soil very quickly, but when it moved to the subsoil, it movement was restricted. For example, if you look at the data here, the graph on the x-axis, we have uh, the concentration of glyphosate uh, and the y-axis, we have the depth profile. And the percentage values are uh, uh, the percentage of initially applied glyphosate amount. So you can see the glyphosate was disappeared from the top soil, but kind of persisted in the subsoil. And it did not move beyond the 50 centimeter. Why? Because that's why I told you, right? There was that hardwood there. And then uh, we looked at the degradation product. Again, in the common thought process, one would think that it's a sandy soil. There are no microbes. So herbicides are not gonna degrade it. But in this case, you can see we have a, a significant amount of AMPA, which is the primary degradation product of glyphosate, which was formed by the microbes in the soil. It was also found. So that means it's, it's entirely different from our perception. You know, when you think about a soil like Florida, how herbicides, not only herbicide, chemical behaves in the soil, it's different from the common perception when you look closer and closer into that. In this case, herbicides can, 
stay in the root zone. For example, for glyphosate in our study, we found that it can lurk or, or linker in about 30 to 40 centimeter or 12 to 16 inches in, in a soil pollen study. That's where, unfortunately, our citrus root zone is, right? So there is always that routes of exposure happening there for herbicides. Uh, you know, it's not like you apply herbicides, it does a job and it leaves. It can stay there depending on what type of material we are using and depending on where we are applying. So that then, then comes the roots into the picture. Okay, your herbicides are gonna be there potentially based on our observation. So how it's gonna impact the roots. So we looked at some of the roots, uh, how herbicide impact the roots, okay? So we used the uh, rhizotron studies for that. For example, we installed rhizotrons. Uh, rhizotrons means we can take images of roots from time to time. And we applied uh, several herbicides uh, in several raids, different herbicide programs. So I'm gonna show some examples here. And uh, we will we'll collect images from time to time. We analyze it to see how much roots were formed, what, what volume, what build up, what was the change over time, the rate of root, root development and things like that. So this is a piece of data I want to show. Again, these are ongoing researches from my graduate students and other uh, research personnel in our group. But, but uh, and again, I understand that many of these results need to be repeated over time and, and um, uh, different locations and things like that. But this are some initial trends I want to show you. So for example, we looked at diuron, a very popular herbicides. Diuron is considered as one of the most used herbicides in the United States uh, after glyphosate in citrus, according to latest statistics. An indaciflam is another alien, which is a relatively new, or not new actually, it's been a popular herbicide as well. So we found that when we compared to untreated control and we checked control, we looked at the root growth rate on the, on the uh, y-axis, uh, it did not give a significant, it's all over the place. You can see there is ups and downs numerically, but when you put in the statistics there, there is no statistical significance. That means, I mean, this is a, this is a trend from a location one, the same trend was observed in location two. So uh, numerically there is ups and downs there, but when you think about it, like uh, into the replicates and put into the statistics uh, significance there, there is not. At least at this time, we can say that residual herbicides like diuron and indaciflam did not, or not significantly impacting the root growth uh, in, uh, uh, in citrus. Uh, but one thing we really found was this, the, the, the amount, I, the, 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 the rates we showed in the earlier graph was corresponding to the, uh, the labeled rates, okay? Maybe higher end of the labeled rates. But when you apply high rates, very high rates over the label without uh, being, uh, you know, adhering to the maximum allowable annual amount, then there will be higher residual buildup and there'll be root uptake and you'll be seeing some uh, injury symptoms like that. So it is very important to make sure or pay attention to the maximum allowable, there's a reason why that number is there on the label, on the product label. We have to adhere with that type of rates, okay? So this is an example of diuron root uptake injury. And we typically see this type of root uptake in the upper branches. That means the material moved through the plant and you see these injuries in the upper uh, quadrant or upper uh, branches. So now the fruit drop or the yield. So again, we know that I'm not a fruit drop expert here, but uh, from my colleagues, I understand it's an HLB, it's mainly due to the HLB associated stress, nutrient stress and things like that. But again, our research question was, do herbicide contribute to this stress? So this is a study we did uh, and uh, it's been published actually. Uh, it's a two year study in Valencia citrus where we used three rates of glyphosate within the, again, label range. And we looked at the fruit drop uh, as a percentage of initial fruit set uh, in two years, actually. And we found there is no significant, again, impact of glyphosate uh, programs on increasing the fruit drop. At least we didn't see that statistically significance. It was similar to untreated control. Uh, but another interesting observation we, were, we made, like with this study was, we were also measuring the fruit detachment force in this study. Fruit detachment force means the force with which the fruit is attached to the pedangle. So the lower the fruit detachment force means highly likely that fruit is gonna, uh, is gonna, gonna actually fall. And it's a natural phenomenon. When the fruit matures, the fruit detachment force is gonna reduce. We looked at the glyphosate. Again, uh, we had three rates of life, I mean, different rates of glyphosate. We mesh collected fruit uh, detachment force from time to time. 
and then uh, we measured it and we found a trend here interesting trend if you look at the graphs uh, on the y axis we have fruit detachment force and the x axis we have the glyphosate rates uh, and if you look at that several time points after the application in all the time points there is a relatively strong negative correlation with the fruit detachment force and the glyphosate amount that we apply that means there may be something happening with the higher glyphosate rate there it may be reducing the fruit detachment force but at the same time we did not observe that in the final food drop data as well so whatever happening it's not enough to cause a fruit drop but maybe it is potentially contributing to that right to that stress you know uh, and again it's it's kind of interesting to us because we did not see an effect in both you know both locations or both time points in the in the overall uh, fruit uh, yield or things like that that means that chelbi stress is already masking that type of thing but we could be cautious uh, in in this type of things like maybe avoiding glyphosate sprays near the uh, fruit maturity window in 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 varieties like valencia that could be that could be helped i mean you can go back to the glyphosate after the harvest or something like that so this is an interesting observation we found and we did similar studies with diuron as well as allion here um, uh, looked at how some of the diuron programs are impacting the fruit drop and we found again uh, there is no it's all over the place but again there is no trend that we found in any of the location it was uh, the, the programs were similar to untreated control or weed checked control where we utilized a glufosinate ammonium and saflofenacil a post emergent program and if you look at the numbers here uh, it is, there was no statistical significance similar for allian at this time as well these are initial results but i'm saying uh, there is again differences in the numerics there but no statistical difference uh, probably uh, we need to look more into this uh, focus more into this but at this time we're not looking we are not seeing uh, uh, any impact of the residual herbicide or for that matter glyphosate on on increasing the fruit drop or decreasing the yield but only only observation we found was glyphosate linking to the fruit detachment force and we looked into that we thought about that uh, we consulted with some experts so the prop, the the the, the, the glyphosate uh, the point we are or the hypothesis we are working on is the production of ethylene uh, glyphosate is a is a precursor of ethylene so if there is an exposure to glyphosate in the plant highly likely it can stimulate ethylene production and guess what ethylene is the one that responsible for the fruit maturity probably if there is an route of exposure of that tree to glyphosate there may be an accelerated ethylene production and probably that's a reason it matures fast or it actually that fruit detachment process is producing anyway so that's about some of the uh, ongoing uh, results we have so generally we are looking more we want to try it with more herbicides we want to screen it with more varieties we want to screen it with more rootstock and more you know things like that so the screening is continuing we'll update you more but at this time uh, you know we can say that we are not seeing any trend uh, where our herbicides are hurting the yield now let me switch my gears here a little bit to some of the considerations that we can think about uh, uh, while doing a herbicide program, how it has a less impact on the tree health as well as the yield, okay? So first and the foremost, we talk about root uptake and things like that, persistence, but the first and foremost, something that we can control, the applicator can control, is to avoid the spray contact with the fruits or the foliage for that matter. I'm, I'm more focusing on fruits here because, you know, foliage whatever happens the trees can come out of it come out of it potentially because of the if the extent of exposure is less but when it touches the fruit then highly likely the fruits are going to fall so i'm more or less focusing on the fruits but you know anything that hurt the foliage is also in turn affecting the yield as well so one of the major aim here is to deliver the herbicide to target otherwise nothing's going to happen you're looking at a picture of a glyphosate spray contact with the low, uh, fruits on the lower hanging branches. So you can see all the, uh, you know, this is actually direct spray contact. Okay, even with the boom spraying, uh, I will tell you how that happens, but you know, uh, uh, it's, it's gonna happen. And this type of contact happens for glyphosate or any other herbicides, the fruits are gonna fall. This is an example of paraquat hitting the fruits. You can see uh, contact injury there these fruits are gonna, not gonna survive either, they're gonna fall. This is a diuron. When you apply diuron, if you're not 
cautious enough the applicator is not uh, cautious enough or bad weather things like that it's going to hit the fruit and you saw the rind injury and it's going to fall so one thing i want to bring here if you're applying herbicide and if you have a bearing a fruit bearing on your branch uh, or the fruit maturity window you have to be really cautious because we have to make sure it's not hitting the fruit and that tiny tiny bit of uh, uh, fruit damage can ultimately end up your fruit fall, adding to your other stresses, right? There is only already fruits falling there. You don't have to lose more fruits. Similar thing with the foliage as well. If you have a paracord injury on a foliage, you see symptoms like that, uh, spots, because it's a contact herbicide. So it will not, will not move in the plant or in the leaves, wherever the spray hit, there will be necrosis, lesions, things like this. Her, uh, glyphosate, on the other hand, when you hit, uh, have a spray hit of glyphosate, you more or less leave more wider uh, damage uh, because the glyphosate moves and your leaves, especially the new flushes, will become uh, uh, needle shaped. So, needle shaped leaves are uh, typical for glyphosate injury. 240, or uh, we have actually uh, more 240 products coming into our toolbox, uh, which is Embed Extra, is a, is a material uh, with 240. It, ha it has got a Label for citrus recently, I believe. And we have Landmaster with a mixture of glyphosate and 240. Again, it's great for broadleaf weeds, especially Spanish needles, uh, Parthenium, things like ragweed, things like that. So if you have, if you are applying products containing 240, it is again very volatile in nature. Uh, so there can be issues of spray drift, and you will see twisted leaves, uh, you know, then, then all the uh, up, you know, new shoots and leaves will be bend and all sort of symptoms that I've been shown here. Similarly, diuron, uh, Carmex, uh, it's a great material uh, for uh, suppression of wheat seed germination, but when you have a contact injury due to a bad application, there can be some, uh, some uh, symptoms on the leaves like uh, yellowing and things like that. In most cases, this given time, this is gonna go off, right? But if you have an issue on the root, I mean, the fruit, I'm sorry, fruit, there will be fruit fall. So we have to be really cautious when you apply herbicides uh, in the, during that uh, fruit maturity window, when you have fruits hanging on your branches, you have to be extra cautious. So in the aciflam, again, when you have a contact uh, with the uh, leaves, uh, you will have, again, it's a residual herbicides, it's applied to the soil, but still uh, you can get, uh, it's not that volatile alien, but if you have a very hot weather, the can thing uh, comes uh, to, the, to the leaves. Another thing I want to point out here, Many herbicides, although not volatile, but if you are applying uh, on a onto a hot soil, the they will form a heat wave and then come to the uh, uh, foliage, lower hanging branches. Although boom application, a boom will prevent some of it. When the boom moves, we have seen some type of that movement onto the lower hanging branches. Anyways, so one thing I want to bring out here to avoid this spray contact with the fruits. We need to be mindful about certain small things like nozzles, especially OC nozzle. So we all know the boom. Uh, we have several nozzles under the boom. And on the tip of that nozzle or onto the end of the boom, we call this a off-center nozzle or OC, OC nozzle. We have some, done some studies recently and with my collaborators, and they found that the, the angle of this off-center nozzle has a big impact on determining whether your spray, how your spray is going to leave the boom, how high it can go, and whether it can hit the, uh, the branches, especially the fruits. For example, it could be from any angle, like right, zero degree to all the way 40, 50 degrees. So these are the pictures of the uh, uh, a nozzle body angle as measured from the nozzle housing. Okay. So for a zero to 10 degree in the top picture, the spray pattern would be like that. So in those cases, the maximum height the uh the the spray can go is five inches as you can see here but if you have a very higher angle like 40 degree or 50 degree uh ozy nozzle -ozy angle uh you know that th this this can be triple the height this uh spray can go over the or beyond the boom can be 16 or 15 to 16 inches high as a result highly likely they can touch the uh, lower hanging branches and fruits on that. But we have to find a balance. I'm not saying you have to keep the OC nozzle to zero degree because uh, you, know, you have to make sure you get the weeds near the drip lines. For that, you have to increase the angle a bit. But 
I would say from our observations, do not keep it really high to 40 or 50 degrees, something like that. This always increases the chance for foliage and fruit phytotoxins, at least during the fruit maturity window. When you have fruits bearing on that, you have to really uh, keep the OC nosal angle at an optimal size. A less than 40 degrees is something we are suggesting to make sure you don't have that, uh, that type of higher and farther movement of your herbicide onto the lower hanging branches. Right, another point I want to bring here is the use of adjuvants and spray deposition agents, especially during the, uh, near the harvesting or fruit maturity window. So I'm, I'm at some examples here include grounded, cross lock. So we found, we found in our studies that the, the size of the droplet has a big impact here. For example, in this graph, you're looking at a uh, chart or graph where we shown that the, the distance a spray droplet can move, a lateral distance a spray droplet can move with a wind speed of three miles per hour. For example, if you have a very, very fine spray, so on the x-axis, the travel distance and the y-axis, the droplet size, like if it's a micro, ultra, micro, ultra spray or a fine spray, a core spray, ultra core spray, things like that. So for example, here, with fine, very fine spray, less than 50 micron spray, your spray is going to distance uh, travel up to a thousand feet. This is pretty significant, right? But at the same time, if you increase the spray size, it dramatically reduces. So this thing we have to keep in mind. So what spray deposition agents are doing, it increases the size of spray droplet. It will never allow whatever herbicide product, compatible product you have, it will never allow the tank mix to form a fine spray, less than 50. So by increasing that uh, spray size, droplet size, you're dramatically reducing the chance of movement, uh, especially in combined with wind and going to the uh, lower hanging branches or foliages or fruits or things like that. So, so that, that type of uh, strategies can be brought in to help reduce the risk, especially when there is a fruit hanging on your uh, branches. Then spray pressure, the same thing. If you have a high pressure, you're gonna result, you're gonna end up in producing a lot of uh, uh, smaller, finer spray particles. So keep the pressure to 20 to 30 PSI, not high uh, than 30 PSI that helps you to come, to come up with some, you know, uh, decently sized particles. So there will be less drift and things like that. I mean, again, our aim here is to make sure those type of small things bring, you know, so that pay attention to those type of strategies so that there will not be any uh, drift or movement of the sprays onto your uh, uh, fruits, right? Then very hot temperatures because we are going to approaching some serious summer here and uh, with very high uh, warm temperatures. So what I suggestion I have to give you is if it's too much hot, postpone the spray, right? Especially if you have fruits there, lower hanging branches. So the research has found that if you have a high than higher 90 degree Fahrenheit soil temperature or air temperature, Again, some of these herbicides can bounce back from the soil to the lower hanging canopy, or lower parts of the canopy. For example, particularly for these herbicides like saflofenacil, carfenderson, or 240 containing products like Trevix is the saflofenacil, AIM is the product name for carfenderson, or 240 uh, has both Landmaster, Ember, Landmaster are both the glyphosate and 240. So these type of products are highly prone to warm weather spray. So you may not notice that, but if you have a very high temperature, higher 90s, when you apply saflofenacil, highly likely it's gonna go to the fruit and cause some damage on the fruit. So if you have a very high temperature going on in summer, just wait and see the temperature cools down or maybe apply in the morning or evenings, avoiding the, that higher, warmer air temperature. This also helps a long way in managing some of those uh, herbicide related injuries. Now, that's, so that's what some of the points I want to bring about uh, uh, to avoid the direct contact with the fruits and the foliage, right? We talked about uh, delivering the herbicide to the target, utilizing right spray boom height. So boom height could be around uh, one and a half feet and things like that, uh, 18 inches or something like that. And making sure we have an optimal OC nosal angle, utilizing some of the adjuvants like spray deposition agents, maintaining an optimal spray pressure, never go beyond 30 PSI, 20 to 30 PSI is a sweet spot there. And always avoiding summer, very hot summer temperature, especially for some 
PPO inhibitor herbicides like Trivix or Carpentrazone AIM and things like that, that can reduce the chances of movement of herbicide uh, from the soil back to the lower hanging branches or lower canopy of the citrus, right? Now, other point here is rotating herbicide. This is very important. I have talked about this in my previous, class, uh, previous lectures here, but, but I want to bring that again and again because we have several tools in our toolbox. I know it's, it's, uh, there are supply chain issues that are, we are trying to work on bringing, adding more tools into this toolbox at this time, but I just want to show you that there are several post-emergent tools that we have uh, that is non-selective herbicides like glyphosate, praraquat, carfenterazone, glufosinate ammonium. So we have some options there and they belong to different mode of action as well. So rotating this post-emergence goes a long way. For example, if you use glyphosate over and over again, there can be a lot of tolerance issues. So a correct met method would be paraquat, glyphosate, glufosinate. Rotate the chemistries that helps you in uh, uh, fighting the tolerance and other resistance issues. Not only that, based on our observation we have recently, we are suggesting to uh, you, if you are on an intense glyphosate program, it's always a good to use an alternative near the harvest timeline, at least 10 weeks before the harvest. If you are uh, trying to do a post-emergent cleanup, uh, you know, it's, it's cautious uh, to, to use a alternative, glyphosate alternative. Then after the harvest and after the picking, we can go back to the glyphosate again. And, and not only for just the post-emergent, if you are planning to use a pre-emergent, like, uh, like indaciflam or flumioxacin or diuron, carmex, et cetera, uh, it's always good to, again, you always mix it with the post-emergence. So always try to mix it with a glyphosate alternative near the harvesting timeline. Uh, we have, you know, based on our studies, we have found that uh, glufosinate is a good uh, uh, tang mix alternative for glyphosate because in the study, you see the different types of pre-emergent herbicides uh, that has been mixed with glyphosate and glufosinate. And after two months, it's pretty similar. There is no significant, there is no difference between this glyphosate and glufosinate. So it's a good idea to include glu, glu, glufosinate or something else as an alternative to glyphosate when you're applying uh, these pre-emergent products near the harvesting timeline, both Valencia as well as. In Valencia, for example, we, are, uh, we like to do some early spring cleanup, right? Early spring spray. So it's, it's good to use an alternative to glyphosate during that time. If there is any chances of that reduction in the food drop, we want to avoid that. Then come back to the glyphosate again after the harvest. So I talked to you about the pre-emergence. Again, I don't want to give you a lot, whole list of pre-emergence here. We have all the products, uh, active ingredients and usage restrictions and things like that available in our production handbook. And also we have some quick reference gates out there uh, that we, you can refer to. But one thing I want to bring to the table is the herbicide retention in the soil, because this is very important, particularly for pre-emergence herbicides. So pre-emergent herbicides are designed to stay in the soil, in the top four inches of the soil, where, there, where we have all the weed seeds and tubers and all the weed emergence activities takes place. So typically these herbicides, depending on their chemical nature, they get absorbed or bound to clay or organic matter and things like that. But, you know, this is in typical crop production soils, right? But what we have here in Florida is a beach sand with less than 1% clay and less than 1% organic matter. So we do not have that much of a binding sites for pre-emergent herbicides. Uh, for example, so I, what I want to bring to this point is we can, we can think about all those a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, strategies into the mind. This is a table uh, where I want to show you the properties of pre-emergent herbicides that we have in the toolbox. We have some, this is an example. There are more products, but I want to show you some products. So the pesticide information center provided me with these details. So this, these are the sol water solubility and soil absorption capacity of the herbicide. So that means these properties determines their movement in sandy soil. So it is always a good practice to rotate the pre-emergent herbicides as well. For example, if you use Diuron in one season, go back to maybe Intasiflam and Shatru, or you can mix both herbicides because I've done a lot of presentation on how to mix two pre-emergence herbicides to increase the spectrum of activity. That all helps. The, the idea here is to make sure we don't build up a lot of residues of a particular pre-emergence in the soil and ultimately 
end up in the movement into the soil and end up in the root zone and things like that. So, if I, you know, along with, along with the rotation of post emergent herbicide, I want to bring this point also into the table. It's always good to rotate the pre emergence as well. And then, then also before that, I want to also talk to you about, I, didn't, I don't have that in my slides here, but there are some strategies out there we have uh, where we can improve the retention of pre-emergent herbicides. We have done some studies I have shown you before also in some workshop. Uh, there are certain materials uh, like hydro wand and uh, you know, they're like binding agents or absorption agents that we can always add or mix to the herbicides that can improve the pre-emergence activities. Not only that, it improves the weed control efficacy and it helps the material to stay in the top few uh, in the softer soil. So rotate pre-emergent herbicides, make sure uh, they're retained in the soil, especially in Florida soils. Then finally, I want to touch base with uh, special care for new plantings because it's very important. Although, you know, this is the first two years of new plantings, uh, we have to be really careful. Uh, it is uh, important to install protective wraps around the trunks of the young citrus trees and always not use uh, high herbicide rates in new plants because those two years are the time when they are trying to establish. So go with the lower end of the label uh, spectrum for herbicides, whether it is pre or post, that always helps. And always keep that uh, protective wrap around the trunk to make sure uh, the spray is not directly hit to it. So, that's the whole uh, point I want to bring here. So basically we talked about ensuring tree and yield safety. Uh, so accurate and safe application in, that includes OC no seal placement, spray pressure, then a deposition agents for uh, pre as well as post emergent herbicides. Uh, think about summer sprays, hot weather concentration. There are certain herbicides we have to be really cautious when you apply in hot weather, rotating, whether it is pre or post, it's always important to rotate herbicides new planting care. And I'm going to talk about some ongoing projects we have, not in detail, but I want to show you some of these projects where we're doing. We're looking at the impacts of cover cropping, which is an emerging practice in citrus. So this is a video of a cover crop mix with sun hemp, daikon radish, and rye grass that's growing beautifully in the row middles. So I'm not showing any data here right now, but I can tell you that the presence of these cover crops are suppressing uh, the weed growth. Uh, not only it's, it has a lot of advantages like adding um, organic matter to the soil, uh, improving the soil quality and things like that. But uh, from, from meat management point of view, we are seeing negative correlation with the cover crop, a lush growth of cover crops. It provides shades and shade is a natural weed killer and it's suppressing the weed germination. And again, that can help us reduce some of the chemical footprint in our uh, uh, raw metals or, or the growth, right? Uh, then another ongoing project is regarding the use of soil amendments such as compost and humic acid. A lot of growers are into this right now, but we want to make sure it is not adding to that weed pressure or how it is impacting your uh, herbicide uh, application, herbicide use uh, in citrus. For example, in this case, you can see the, uh, the composting process uh, is actually uh, increasing a little bit of uh, nut such pressure here, but it, again, this could be related to that particular grove location as well. But, but we are trying to look into where if you have a compost application going on, how we should, uh, you know, uh, we should tailor our herbicide use with that, whether it's going to increase the weed pressure or it's going gonna, it's gonna to decrease it. We don't know. So things like that, we're looking into that. Apart from this, we are also screening several herbicides for their, as I mentioned earlier, for their you know, non-target impacts in citrus on yield safety, tree safety, and things like that. We are trying to uh, look into more products, herbicide products, to add them uh, as a potential tools into the toolbox, both post and pre. So many of the data I have shown you comes from my student research. Uh, they do all the hard work. Uh, Robert Riffer is here, Nirmal Timilsna. I'm just here to present. So here is uh, Nirmal uh, collecting his uh, fruit drop data. And I want to thank uh, my cooperators, uh, my awesome team, uh, all my uh, academic as well as industrial cooperators. Thank you very much. That's all I have right now. And this is a video of the weed garden we have in the back. So I will be taking any questions if you have. Sure, sure. Oh, see, no, yeah. 
Boom. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. That will reduce the that will increase the uh, droplet size. In, yeah. Yeah. But the, the point here is, you know, we have to make sure that smaller size droplets are not formed because it, once it's formed, combined with the weather we have, it's gonna blow onto your uh, uh, foliage. Yeah. So any efforts to reduce that? Yeah, a, that's a great point. Uh, you brought here uh, air induction nozzles. That's a great alternative. Uh, it, it, you know, it, you know, it can actually control a lot of droplet size. Any questions from the Zoom? Please, we have some time. Right, I think uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'll hand over the floor to Monji now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanesari. Thank you all for uh, joining us. If you need CEUs, you need to send an email to Jean McAvoy with your license number and email address. And hopefully, you will earn CEUs. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you next month.